Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon. Today is episode 56 of My Secular Bible Study, in which we are looking at the book of Titus. Titus is only three chapters long. It is the letter of Paul to Titus. Titus is a really prominent figure in the New Testament, aside from Paul. The first thing to note is that Titus is a Gentile convert. If we go back to Galatians 2, 3, we can see that this is very important because Paul refuses to have Titus circumcised. He's a physical representation of Paul's message of by faith alone. He's a leader in the early church. We're going to see that in this book where he is tasked with going to Crete, appointing elders, resolving conflicts, correcting people. Overall, he is one of the main side characters to Paul, right along with Timothy and Silas. Getting into book overview, we're going to break this down into three segments representing its three chapters. And though it is a shorter book, it is significant. This is one of the pastoral epistles, and we'll get to the authorship issues here in just a minute, but there is a lot of information in this very quick letter. Segment one, or chapter one, is really all about church leadership. You establish order through qualified leadership, and so Paul is sure to instruct Titus on what that's going to look like. He wants the appointing of elders in every single town. He wants there to be qualifications for what these leaders or these elders need to have. We're going to get into that during problematic passages. Also, we do have the intro from Paul, and this is interesting because in verse 4 it says, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. That's quite the greeting from Paul, again, assuming that this is from Paul. And really quick, simple time out. I want to say, many people have said, Brandon, why do you keep talking about it even in your titles and the thumbnails and you reference it's Paul when you know that these are forgeries or they are written in his name? They are not authentic letters of Paul. I have answered this before. You can go back and watch the rest of the Pauline epistles, but generally I am coming at this from the view that Christians are. They are the ones who have allowed it to remain in their canon despite the scholarly work being done both by believers and non-believers. They are the ones who have not updated their Bibles. They are the ones who still preach it from the pulpit. And so if that is the case, where they are utilizing these words as if they are true scripture and they're from this greatest of all apostles, then fine, let's go ahead and have that and critique it as if. Because it's only more damaging and damning to have these be from Paul and have more inconsistencies and more contradictions. Having them as scripture at all is problematic, that's for sure. But until they change their tune about it, Let's go ahead and look under that view and note what's wrong. Plus, it's just simpler than saying the forgery that was attributed to Paul, etc. So, quick side note. Let's get back on track here, move straight into segment two, chapter two, and what do we find? Community, ethics, sound doctrine, more preaching from Paul. And it's going to help when you get to point three here and you understand what was going on in Crete at the time. But Paul is needing to establish a lot of very specific ideals about what Christian communities should look like. Here in this chapter specifically, it's going to go after individual groups, mainly five, older women, older men, younger women, younger men, and bond servants, if we're using the nice term, slaves. That's right, we're going to get into more slave apologetics in this book, and it's as disgusting as all the rest. And then segment three, chapter three, is just going to move into how that actually looks, establishing the correct practical guidelines for Christian and communal living. And this is really interesting because, again, Paul's been all over the place with this. Sometimes it's gentle correction. Sometimes it's very harsh correction. Sometimes it is a call to live by a higher value. Sometimes it is to mesh and kind of assimilate into the community while still having Christian values. And so I'm excited to talk about that towards the end of this episode. And at the end of this chapter, we also do get some doctrine just about, again, salvation through faith alone and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, things like this. So moving on to point two, authorship and date. There's a few things here that I want to cover. One is when you have Paul writing to an individual as opposed to an entire church community. These individual letters, often the Christian so far in my videos like First and Second Timothy has said, it's not fair for you to critique it in the way that you are because this was private communication. Paul is talking to Timothy or now Titus differently than if he's just addressing the whole church. And sure, I understand that and there should be some context to consider. Where the Christians are wrong about this is saying that it's not fair to critique it because of its one-on-one -on -one nature when they use it from from the pulpit. If you're going to take something that you like from, say, 2 Timothy, where all scripture is God-breathed, and you want to talk about the use of scripture, but you don't like when I talk about Paul's advice on how to treat slaves or women, that's just hypocrisy. 
That's just the believer picking and choosing the parts they like and saying, oh, this is for everyone. And then when I bring up a critique of something that is obviously incorrect, immoral, or wrong, they say, well, no, you really, you know, that's, that's just private communication. What are you talking about? Again, it wasn't me or any other atheist or anyone else that critiques your Bible that put this into the canon. It's not us that uses it for preaching. It's not us that builds personal devotions or includes it in testimonials or preaches it or writes books about it or anything like that. No, you're putting it out there as scripture. You're putting it out there as useful. You're putting it out there as what is right, what God wants, what is doctrine. All we're doing is holding it to that standard. And when it so obviously fails, you can't just say, oh, well, this, oh, well, that. It either is scripture and needs to be held to that standard or it's not. But that's just a quick aside on that. Into the authenticity, the traditional view is that this is written by Paul. It's a pastoral epistle to Titus. And because of that, we can get insight into the mind of Paul on what he thought was correct in terms of doctrinal teaching. And thus, we can apply it to our modern churches. However, the scholarly view is that this, like First and Second Timothy, is a later writing, probably between the years 80 and 100 for Titus here, and is probably someone that was a disciple of Paul or a follower of Paul that is wanting to kind of make some updates or corrections for what they see going on and attributing it to Paul, including it as a letter to Titus to give it that extra oomph. Long story short, on point two, it is most likely a non-authentic letter of Paul. No, you can never be 100% certain on either way, but there are good reasons that I've covered in plenty of the other videos to say why scholars believe this. I'm excited to move here into point three with historical context because there's a lot of really fascinating things that when you understand it about Crete and you bring it into this letter, you're like, uh oh, very interesting. So first of all is just what is Crete? Where is Crete? Crete is the largest island in the Aegean Sea. That made it a significant cultural and commercial hub in the Mediterranean. Its strategic location then makes it just this wonderful melting pot and this crossroads for all these various cultures. And so Paul, I'm sure, was like, hey, if we can get Crete going correctly with all of these churches, especially considering their reputation, which we'll get to, this can be a major source of spreading the good news. But it's quite the hill to climb because the Cretan reputation was not so kind. And it's not just Paul or whoever wrote this letter that is giving them this reputation. Even authors like Homer or Polybius wrote very similar things in terms of the Cretan ethic or lack thereof. We get a verse in Titus 1.12 where one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And Paul jumps in in the next verse and says, this testimony is true. And culturally, what is going on is this is a Roman province in the first century, and you had a lot of ex-mercenaries living there. You had a very promiscuous setting going on, lots of young women not wanting to marry, supposedly, and just engaging in fun fornication, and men having no desire to leave and maintain a family, very similar to the critiques that are going on in today's America. That is what is going on here. And in the middle of this, you have these Greek concepts of who Jesus is and how he fits in. And remember that as a formerly Greek territory, you have a ton of Zeus belief. Zeus is the high God and he's crafty and he's a liar and he'll bend the rules sometimes to do this. And Paul is trying to straighten this out. Nope. That's not who Jesus is. You don't get to map that onto him. And he has some really specific verses about God being a perfect God of perfect truth and faithfulness. And we're going to get to that in problematic passages as well. And so besides the false beliefs that are going on and the life of sin that these people are supposedly living, the bad reputation for their dishonesty and their lack of ethics or morality, you also have leadership issues going on. Grifters, people that are in leadership in the church simply to make a quick buck. Thus, Paul's letter to Titus for Titus to go and fix this. And we'll see more of that when we get into some of the actual verses. But let's move straight into point four, literary analysis. Titus is notably directive and prescriptive. We are not having a conversation. This is not an open dialogue. Titus, do this. Titus, say this. It's an authoritative tone that is meant to fix and correct. In terms of literary features here, again, and this is becoming more popular in the last few letters that we've gone through, household codes. What is the proper Christian family to look like? We get a lot of moral exhortations really diving into the 
Stoic virtue ethics, such as self-control, justice, and piety, yet they are distinctly Christianized, which is that really fascinating molding that has happened with Paul. There's a lot of diatribes in here, and despite the debate over authorship, you have some really classic Pauline language and theology. So whoever wrote this, if it wasn't Paul, definitely was familiar with Paul. So that'll take us straight into point five main themes, and theme number one is going to be ethics and morality. This is harped on almost more than most other books. Maybe just considering how short of a letter it is and even the length of the chapters, this is its central theme for sure. That's going to look like practical application, social impact, and kind of this countercultural idea. How do we be in the world but not of the world, so to speak? Our second theme is definitely grace and salvation. This author is not light on pointing out the doctrinal side of things as well. There's the theological depth to it. There is the eschatological hope. But more than anything, there is this idea of behavioral transformation. And I think that it is from this book and a few other parts of other letters where the common pastor or apologist is able to make this great claim. Oh, you know, Paul couldn't just outright get rid of slavery because that would lead to a slave rebellion and that would actually hurt the end goal of what's trying to happen here, but there is going to be moral progression because if we can just get more people to be Christian and act Christian, stay in their place while doing so, speaking to women and slaves, then we're going to see this natural organic behavioral change. It's a really sick and twisted excuse, and I'm going to cover it more here in point seven. But the third and final theme would just be that of church leadership, qualifications, roles, and impact on the culture. So let's move on to point six, reception and influence. And the first thing I want to mention is what I just covered, which is how often these ideas from this letter are used apologetically. But also, based off the last theme that we covered, it is really seeped into how we lead our churches. What do we look for in our elders? What standards do we hold people to? Is there a biblical basis for it? And Titus is one of those main biblical bases. We could talk a lot more about early church fathers and what they thought and where they implemented these things, but ultimately it does come down to these two things. Christian behavior, and thus the apologetics of that, and church leadership, and where we're basing that. That's how I would focus it. Again, you could take this a lot of different directions, but I'm excited to move just straight into point seven, contradictions, problematic passages. Let's start with contradictions and go to our list. So first we have the role of works in salvation. Titus 3.5 states that God saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. But, and always, going to James 2.24, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Again, I understand, and we've covered this so many times that I'm hesitant to even say another word. I know how the apologists marry the two. Yes, it's faith alone, but real faith will look like X producing works. And it's simply not what Paul states. It is putting the onus on the individual instead of the grace of God. They are truly opposed ideas. Next, we could look at the qualifications for church leadership. Titus 1.6 requires that an elder must have children who believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. But in 1 Corinthians 7.8, Paul suggests it is better for the unmarried and widows to remain single as he is. He making himself the greatest example. You could say, well, maybe you can have an elder who's not married or doesn't have kids, but if they are married and have kids, they should look like this. And that's fine. But I think what is confusing, and again, where I would state it's more of a difference than a contradiction, is throughout all of these Pauline epistles, we get different ideas about what is best. Is it good to have a family? Is it good to bring children into the world? Is it better if you can serve God better by being unmarried? And so again, not claiming a direct contradiction on this one, but something that really you can't say it is best to be like me and single and then say, but in church leadership, it's totally fine. Be married, have children, but just make sure that they behave accordingly. Also, isn't this interesting in terms of practical application and implication? And this is something that you will hear churches debate over internally. I'm really the perfect example of this. My mother was in church leadership. She was the missions director for our church. That's already going against Pauline advice, where he does not permit women to teach. But for the churches that have excused that as no, that was just for Ephesus, and it's different, so we're going to allow it, so they allow my mother in. I'm not a believer anymore. Should she be kicked out at this point? At what point 
you know, I'm a grown child. Is it if your seven-year-old doesn't believe, your 17-year-old doesn't believe? What if they believed most of the time that that woman was in leadership? And how do you verify this? How do you know and then choose to act on it? It's just extremely messy to have these kinds of rules or ideals for your leadership. And the vagueness of this and the lack of here's what to do when and if, and here's the dividing lines and all of that is what leads to so much of the mess and the denominational splits and the infighting in the church and the disagreement and the discord and all of the things that seem like they're anything other than the peace of God or the perfect truth or perfect justice. You can't have it when it's all based off these little excerpts, these tiny little letters that don't agree with each other. This is me trying to show you why, even if you could find a way to marry these things and make them congruent, which most of the time you cannot, it's still lacking. It's still less than what we would expect for a God who wants his church, his bride, the embodiment of his word to be, to act, to impact the world. Sure looks a lot more like what a bunch of men would come up with who can't agree with one another. Now, this isn't really a contradiction, but it's fun. It's pointed out by lots of different people. It's called the Cretan paradox. So going back to Titus 1, 12 through 13, where he cites the Cretan prophet that says, Cretans are always liars. Well, if it's coming from a Cretan prophet, doesn't that mean that he's lying about the fact that all Cretans are liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons? Aside from that, though, if we want to get into the contradiction of it, James 2, 9 warns against showing favoritism or disfavoritism in this case, which Paul is doing when he agrees and makes this broad sweeping generalization that all Cretans, as he says in verse 13, the testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Now, we've talked a lot on this channel about the incorrect ideas of labeling entire groups of people or ethnicities or God's collective punishment. And yet, here we see it again. Obviously, not all Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. But Paul is fine saying that it is. And that, I think, is problematic. And I guess we're kind of, as always, dipping into some of the problematic passages early on. Getting back to salvation and good works, I want to read to you from chapter 2, verse 11, for a couple verses here. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly possessions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So he's underscoring here, I wanted to read the whole thing to you, that God's grace trains us to live righteously. Yet compare this with Romans 4, 5. However, to the one who does not work but trust God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Once again, their faith alone is credited as righteousness. Faith is the good work. It's not that faith will produce an attitude or righteousness that will train you to produce actual good works. Faith is the good work. And so again, we just see too many different ideas floating around that sometimes some can match with part of each other, but not fully and not all of them all together. We do not have a straight line of understanding here. There's too much word salad at play to make this a simple concept. And shouldn't it be simple? Shouldn't anyone be able to point to any book in this entire Bible? Hell, forget the Old Testament, any book within the New Testament and just say, look, over and over and over, the message is the same. Believe and be saved. It is about God's grace and not about you or your work. And yet we have all these caveats all over the place about, well, it will be your work, but only because you'll be trained in righteousness. Well, it will be your work, but because faith equals a righteous work. Well, it will be your work, but because if you have faith, you'll naturally have a byproduct of these works. Like they can't even agree on when we do incorporate work, how we back that up and justify it. It's so much. Let's just do a couple more really quick. I might have you look up some of these on your own, but I want to point out the rebuking verse general correction. In Titus 1.13, he encourages rebuking sharply, as you just heard me read, so that they will be sound in faith. But in 2 Timothy 2.25, just last book, he says, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. These are truly contradictory ideas. We could also talk about teaching sound doctrine versus cultural accommodation. Now, there's a couple ways that we could approach this. One is going back 
to who we're talking about here, Titus, who was not circumcised. Paul did not allow it, but he does have Timothy circumcised because where he's going with Timothy has a much more heavily populated Jewish density. And so he thought it might help things. And we've seen Paul in other letters say, you know, when he's here, he acts like this. And when he preaches here, he preaches like this. And I'm all for catering your message to your audience and mirroring them and all of the other tactics, but for an objective message of perfect truth, shouldn't it just be the same all the time? If you have to bend it and manipulate it to fit where you want it so that it'll be better received. And this is, by the way, the excuse again, and we're going to get to it here in a minute, with why he doesn't just outright condemn slavery. The real reason is because he didn't think it was wrong, obviously, but Christians today can't be okay with that, so we have to make up all these other reasons. And again, we see more examples of this in Titus with these different groups that I mentioned, the bond servants, the old and young men, the old and young women. But in others, there's kind of this universal Christian idea. It's just, it's all over the place. And lastly, what I would say, and maybe this will be the first thing that we cover here for problematic passages, Titus 1 to, and I'll just read it to you. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. A God who never lies. We could do this for an entire video, and I've covered many, many times where God did not honor his word, did not keep his promises. And there's a billion excuses and apologetics about why God didn't lie and why these things can change and how they were actually dependent and subjective off of what men would do and all of these other things. And sometimes that context is correct. There are times where people have pointed out that God has lied or God is unfair and they're wrong. That doesn't mean they're all wrong. And if you want a video of the ones I think are most obvious, you can look at my one on God's promises. So, Starting problematic passages, and we kind of just covered it there, promoting a God that never lies when we have so many issues with this God's word would be the first one. So again, Titus 1, 2. But what else? Let's get to that Titus 1, 6 verse here. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Other translations have said blameless, by the way. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. It goes on from there, and most of those are okay. Of course, that's what you want in any kind of leadership. But the one where I really want to point out the issue is, again, with the unbelieving children. How do you prove it? How do you know? How do you control it? And why would this person be judged off the belief of their children? Well, Brandon, if they have children that have gone wayward, that means what? Go ahead, say it. That they did a bad job as a parent? Does that mean parents can 100% fully control who their children become? Shouldn't we pass this on as a law for everything else? A child becomes a murderer. Lock up the parent. A child had an affair when they were older and married themselves. Oh, the parents must get divorced, right? Like, it's the same lunacy, but yet here it's sound wisdom for elders. I think it's insane. People should be accountable for what they do. That's what this is. I think this is why it is hitting me so incorrectly. It is just further proof that this whole Christian concept of generational sin, it starts in the garden. Adam and Eve sin, and all of humanity is cursed and fallen forever and deserving of hell. In fact, I've made a whole video about all the ways where the child is punished for the sins of the father. You can see that here. And this is kind of a reversal of that, where everything is linked. Can't we treat people as individuals? So in this tiny little book, you get a judgment of an entire group of people, all of them liars, evil, and lazy. So there's your collective punishment. And then you get directions for what an elder can be based off the belief of their children. So we get that generational sin thing going. Those two concepts are two of my biggest issues with the religion in general. Generational sin and collective punishment, and they're both right here. Isn't that amazing? It's fully ingrained in the religion all the way through. I think I've beat a dead horse in Titus 1, 12 through 13 with the whole all Cretans are yada, yada, yada. But that's obviously problematic. Do I need to point out how ridiculous it is for Paul to already have that bias and then double down on it and say, yes, this is indeed true, and then send Titus under this knowledge? Come on. Let's get to the slavery one, though. This comes to us in Titus 2, 9 through 10. Bond servants, and I'm reading from the ESV, which I need to stop doing. I need to get one of my other Bibles, because in most translations, this says slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything 
they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So, once again, Christian slaves, stay in your place. Submit to your masters in everything. So be abused, essentially, is what it is saying. Regardless of how your master is, your job is to be submissive, well-pleasing, and non-argumentative. I just watched the Mormon documentary, the FLDS one. It's called Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey. And that was a saying that the prophet had everywhere for all the little children. Keep sweet pray, and obey. And it is such a sick thing. And I know so many Christians who have watched that documentary and said, oh man, this is disgusting. And then they'll go and they'll read their Bible, supposedly, and they'll see verses like this in Titus, and they'll completely disregard it. Keep sweet, pray, and obey. This is even worse. You are owned as property, and just so we don't upset the master so that maybe they can become Christians and become in this in-group, because if we start a slave rebellion, that's not going to look good for Christians. That's going to be the loud, annoying Christians that say, we deserve equal rights. Heaven forbid. So stay in your place. Be well-mannered. It's like handmade stuff. I mean, this is absolutely disgusting. And what's worse is how the modern day pastor will approach this with all of those excuses that I just mentioned, acting like this at all makes any sense or is fair, shows a God of justice. And then they'll point to the stupid verse about Paul saying that there is no male or female, there is no slave or freeman. Yes, there is, and you're telling them to stay put and smile and treat their masters well, no matter what. Verses like this, this verse alone should be enough for you to know this is not a good religion. This is not a moral god or moral leaders in this religion. Yuck. Don't worry, whenever Paul talks, or supposed Paul talks, about slaves, he also always talks about women. If we go to chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And so, train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Now, there are messages for the young man. It is to urge the younger men to be self-controlled, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity and dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. I'm pretty fine with all of that. And why not just say that for the women too? Why do the women have to be pure? Why do the women have to be submissive? Why do they have to be working at home? How many modern churches have women on staff? Isn't there a place in the home? Like it says it right here. What about a woman who's just attending church, but you know, she's working outside the home? Do you condemn her? Do you speak to her harshly as Titus says, or do you choose a different Pauline verse and you speak to her gently? Either way, do you correct her or have our morals and equality advanced despite the religion, despite the scriptures, and we have to ignore the things that we don't like. But then if you happen to be a straight person who is offended by gay people, you have no problem pointing to scriptures, even in the New Testament from Paul, about the incorrectness of homosexuality. All I want is consistency, which is terrifying because to be a consistent Christian, you do end up with things like The Handmaid's Tale. You do end up with Project 2025. I'm so glad Christianity is watered down and people don't take their Bible very seriously. But all that does is prop up and promote this religion as if it's healthy, as if it's beneficial to all when it's not. You're good despite your religion. I'm so happy. But stop attributing it to the religion that says the opposite. That's why religion is dangerous. That's why progressivism is dangerous. It allows for fundamentalism. If we just called a spade a spade and we all saw that this book was not good, this God was not real, and if he was, he's not good, then we could do away with it. But the middle ground, the watered down, the Starbucks Christianity allows for all the other abuses. This is something that I want to talk about much more and we'll be doing more videos on. There's other verses, you know, the sharp rebuking, the universal submission to authority of Titus 3.9, avoiding these foolish arguments about genealogies and quarrels about the lots. Like, this is all apologists do. Like, can't we just follow the Bible or discard it completely? Because the other thing, and this is my last point here, is if everyone did follow the Bible, modern society would actually see how horrendous it is, and then it would be done away with. But that middle ground gives so much allowance. Thanks for being here. I think we'll have a typical Sunday episode coming up, not a podcast episode. I just haven't had the time I need for the full interviews and editing that are required for the podcast, but I'm sure hopefully the Sunday after that will be back onto episode three. If you haven't checked out the first two episodes, check those out. If you want a list of the videos I mentioned, check the description below. I'll see you Sunday, and until then, keep.
Thank you. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my Iconoclist, Anne, Boris, GVI, Jacob, Joe, Kiboga, Perry, Rocket, Sean, and Strong Rex, my Humanist Heroes, Imposter, James, Jared, and Christy, my Atheist Advocates, Caleb, Jeff, Jeffrey, Paul, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my Secular Scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of the channel or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people.